this morning, Lord God, we come to seek your face. God, we come to lift up a shout of praise and worship, Lord, unto you. There's nobody holy like you are. No one who loves us like you do, God. No one who provides like you do, Jesus. Lord, and we're thankful in this place, God, today. It's not just songs, God, but there's songs from our heart, God, this morning. There's no one like you, God. There's nobody like you, Jesus. Nobody like you, Jesus. Come on, from your heart, come on, just tell him. There's nobody like you, Jesus. There's nobody like Jesus. Nobody like my Jesus. There's no one, no one like you. There will be no other God before you, Lord. There will be no other gods before you, Jesus. There is no one above you, no one beside you. There's nobody like you, Jesus. There will be no other God before you, Lord. There's no one, no one, no one. There's no one, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. Forget all 
of the great things you did. When did I throw away faith for the impossible? How did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? How do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You are more than able.
but it's been too long no God welcomes you with open arms today to move in your life we thank you Jesus we worship you Lord I've come a long way I've seen how you were Jesus there's so much goodness and grace it's much more than I deserve because I know who I am God I know but I can stay where I'm at Oh, we've come this far by faith yeah. And I just can't turn back Cause he's not done with me, yeah Oh, come on, church Cause he's not done with me, yeah Somebody in this place, God's not done with you. Yeah. There's so much more to your story to tell. Cause God's not done with you. Ooh, yeah. He's not done with me. Yeah. Come on, sing it and believe it. He's not done with me. Yeah. He's still writing our story. There's so much more. sing one more song in this place this morning. Well, as we proclaim, God, we, we believe it. God, we receive, God, your will for our lives. 
just all around this place, won't you lift your hands to heaven as an act of worship, as a sign of surrender. Say, Jesus, have all of me. Jesus, have all of me, Lord. Have all of me, Jesus. Have all of me, Lord. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. To you belongs the glory, the praise of all the world. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. All blessing and all honor, majesty and all. Jesus, have it all. Jesus, have it all. Come on, sing it. All belongs to glory, the praise of all the world. Jesus have it all, Jesus have it all, a blessing and a honor, a majesty and a Come on, sing it again. Jesus have it all, Jesus have it all, to you belong to glory, the praise of all the world. Jesus have it all. Say hey. 
can you make that the declaration of your heart today lord have all my days lord have all of my life have every part of me god you can have every bit of me lord i surrender myself to you i lay myself down at your feet god you have every part of me we give ourselves to you today god Of this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul says, I kneel myself before you, O God. I kneel myself before you, O God. And he goes on to talk about how God has created all the families and the fellowship of God and He's created the church and then it leads into the passage of scripture we all know out of Ephesians 3, which is he will do immeasurably more than we can ask or think. But I don't find it ironic that the promise to do immeasurably more than we can ask or think started with a posture of submission that says, God, you can have every part of me. I kneel myself before you. Lord, I know that you can do it. I know that you can work. I know that you've created all things and you will do immeasurably more than I can ask or think. But it starts, God, with you, with me giving you all of my days all of my life have it all Jesus so I wonder if that's your prayer today that God have every part of me because I believe that you're going to do immeasurably more than I can ask or think in my life maybe you walked into these doors with a little weight on your shoulders today. Maybe you walked in just a little downtrodden. Can I encourage you today with the promise that God wants to do immeasurably more than you can ask or think in your life too? But it starts with a posture of submission. So if that's you today, I just want to pray over you. I just want to pray just that God's hand would be upon you, just that God's hand of favor and blessing would be over your life. Because I believe that as we submit our lives to him, he's going to do immeasurably more than we can ask or think. If that's you today, if that's you today, if you just slip your hand in the air, I just want to pray over you. If you say, Brad, I just walked in heavy today and I need God to do more immeasurably more than I could ask or think. If you just slip your hand in the air, I want to pray over you today. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you today, humbled, grateful, and thankful that you continue to shower your presence on your people. Lord, and I pray for every hand that is raised in this place, God, just a hand that says, God, I'm tired. I'm, I walked in with this heaviness, God. I walked in with some things going on in my life, God. And I'm here to surrender myself to you today. God, I pray, Lord, that every hand raised would walk in and say, God, I, 
lay aside, lay aside every weight, every sin. Lord, I cast aside all of the heaviness, Lord, and I pray, Lord, I pray for an extra dose of endurance today as you do immeasurably more than I could ask or think in my life. Lord, I pray for signs, wonders, and miracles in the lives of those who raised a hand today. God, I pray that you would move bountifully, Lord, in blessing, Lord, in provision, Lord, in hope. God, I pray for healing. God, I just pray for your supernatural work to happen in the lives of those that raised their hand today. God, we thank you that we can find our dependency in you. And Lord, we offer ourselves to you today. Would you just take one more moment? And would you just praise the God in heaven who has laid it all down for you? We worship you, God. We bless your name, Jesus. Lord, have all of me. Lord, have all of us. We lay ourselves down before you, God. And we just pray, God. We pray that you would move in the lives of your people the way that only you can do. We give you praise, glory, and honor today because you're a good God and you desire to pour yourself out over your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you give God a hand clap of praise this morning? Amen and amen. You can be seated. Are you thankful for his presence today? Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Generations Church. Happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, man, we are just so excited to have you here today. And man, you always know on a holiday weekend who the extra saved folks are. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, man. We just, we are so excited to have you here today. We are excited that you took a few minutes to join us this morning. And uh, man, we just, uh, we just welcome you to Generations Church today, especially if you're a guest with us. If you're a guest, uh, we welcome you. Would you welcome our guests with a round of applause? If you're a guest with us today, maybe it's your first time, maybe it's your second or third time, we welcome you. There's some information that's coming up in the video right after me that is just for you that involves the Connect card that you see on the screen there. Uh, it just wanted to bring your attention to it so that you knew uh, that that little part was for you. And uh, again, we welcome you for coming today. We are so thankful uh, that you stepped in the doors. And just by coming today, you're a part of our Generations Church family. So we welcome you you today. There's a ton of great things happening at Generations Church. We're launching into summer. Pastor Brian's going to talk a little bit about summer when he comes up. So uh, I want to bring your attention to the announcements that are going to play right after me and check all the great things happening out. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michaela Droz, and here's a look at what's happening around Generations Church. We want to welcome all of you who are watching and attending our service today. If you are a first time or returning guest, we are so glad you are here. At Generations Church, we believe in community and friendship and would love to connect with you. If this is your first time with us, check out our Connect card or the Connect QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. You can fill out the contact section and return it to our guest services desk in the foyer. We have a gift bag, including a Chick-fil-A gift card to say thank you for being our guest today. If this is your second or third visit, we ask that you complete a Connect card as well. Just write your name and check the returning guest box and return to the guest services desk or put it in the drop box in the foyer. For everyone, we have a prayer section on the Connect card and invite you to share a prayer request with our pastors. We also have a response section on our Connect card. If you would like to be baptized, become a member, join a Connect group, or join a serve team, you can fill it out and return to guest services desk. Good morning, Generations Church. I want to read a promise from Scripture concerning your giving. Hebrews 6 says, God will not forget your work and the love that you have shown Him as you've helped His people and continue to help them. God knows when you give to help others. 
He knows when it's done out of abundance, and He knows when it's done out of sacrifice. His promise is that He will remember you and will respond at the appropriate time by helping you and blessing you. We have many ways in which you can worship this morning by giving. If you're here with us in person, the ushers are here to serve you, or you can use the drop box in the foyer. You can give online at our website and set up recurring giving at gctlh.org or on our Generations Church app on your phone or by scanning the give QR code on the seat back in front of you or in the foyer. If you're new to our church, we're so glad that you're here. Please do not feel obligated to give in any way. You are our guest and we're glad to have you. Again, I want to say thanks for your faithfulness, your heart for the Lord and for others. Thank you, Generations Church, and God bless you. Here at Generations Church, our core values define who we are and what's important to us as a church. We are spirit empowered. We believe in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We rely on his guidance, wisdom for life, and we welcome him in all our gatherings. May is National Foster Care Month. We want to take a moment to thank foster parents and those who support foster care for the incredible and selfless work you do every day. We believe it is the church's role to care for the fatherless and our GC Families Ministry is our response to the foster care crisis in our community. We would love to have you join us in support by praying for the foster community, partnering with us by joining our team or donating to our placement packages initiative or becoming a foster parent yourself. For more information on getting involved, you can speak to our ministry lead, Melissa Dansell, or visit our website at gctlh.org. GC Ladies will be meeting for a seven-week virtual summer Bible study beginning June 6th on Thursday evenings at 8 o'clock p.m. Find Your People Video Bible Study by author Jenny Allen offers practical solutions for creating true community in a world that is more connected and more isolated than ever before. Sign up at gctlh.org or contact Becky Nugent at becky at gctlh.org for more information. We invite all GC boys and girls, elementary age and younger, and their dads or father figures to join us on Sunday, June 16th at 9.30 a.m. for a special Hot Cakes with My Hero Father's Day breakfast. There will be pancakes, juice, coffee, and a great chance to have a special breakfast with your kids on Father's Day. For more information regarding Generations Church, its ministries, events, or other serving opportunities, feel free to visit our guest services desk in the foyer, follow us on social media, download our app, or visit our website at gctlh.org. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. They stood as heroes in our midst, with courage in their hearts and fists. And with each step, they faced the call to serve their land, to give their all. They left behind their homes and kin for fields of battle, fierce and grim. With steadfast hearts and selfless grace to fight for freedom in every place. They marched across the dusty sands to foreign shores and distant lands. And there they fought with all their might in blazing sun and darkest night. Their names now etched in history's page, a lasting tribute for every age to those who served and fell in line to keep our freedoms ever shine. For those who paid the ultimate cost, their lives laid down, their battles lost their sacrifice of priceless gain for the freedom we proudly claim. We honor them with every breath and cherish them beyond their death, their bravery a beacon bright guiding us through the darkest night. So let us pledge with all our might to keep their legacy shining bright and hold them close within our heart their memories never to depart. Amen. Well, uh, <clears throat> happy Memorial Day and uh, just the videos, a reminder of uh, 
why as a country we just take a, a few days and we're just thankful for those who've given their lives for our freedom and for our country. How many of you have been to Arlington National Cemetery? Have you? Listen, if there's ever a time that kind of the sacrifice of, uh, of our soldiers uh, comes, comes into play, it's if you've ever visited there. So we're very mindful, we're very appreciative of those who, and families of, of those that have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And I know they can't all hear, but can we just do a round of applause this morning? We're so thankful. We're very thankful. That may be some of you and our family, church family as well, so... Uh, hey, uh, a couple of things really quick. At the end of service, we're going to take communion, and if you're, uh, you know, you're more than welcome to take communion. If you don't have communion emblems, would you just raise your hand, and the ushers will come bring you some really quick. If you just really quick, they're looking for you there. Good deal, good deal. So just want to uh, want to mention that. And uh, it's got two layers. It's kind of complicated. So uh, if you can't figure out communion, ask your neighbor, because that would be a great part of communion, is sharing uh, instructions on how to have communion. So, uh, hey, we did this last week. Uh, we just want to do it this week. We want to say thanks to our teachers, administrators, professors for a great, great school year. Uh, would you give them a hand this morning? We're so appreciative. Homeschool parents, homeschool parents as well. And if you didn't get one last week, uh, there's a Chick-fil-A card uh, for you at guest services. So we just want to uh, say thanks to you for a great school year. Just wanted to mention that. Uh, I want to let you know a couple of uh, a little staff information. Pastor Witt and Linda, they have been doing an interim at uh, filling in at Cottondale for a church that doesn't have a pastor. So if you haven't seen Witt and Linda on a Sunday for a little while, they're filling in, probably have a few more weeks uh, until the church uh, bring, calls a new pastor. So that's kind of where uh, where they're at. And then also uh, Lexi Jones, our church administrative assistant office manager, uh, she starts maternity leave tomorrow or Monday. So uh, we're about to have another baby around here at Generations Church. So uh, our, she is here this morning and uh, so she'll be off for several months. And while she is out, Cher Snedeker, would you please stand? Cher is going to be taking her place, so uh, <clears throat> amen. Cher's been with us in the office a couple weeks, kind of training, so uh, if you call or email, it'll be uh, Cher on the phone or, or email, so if we can serve you in any way, just let us know, but just wanted to uh, uh, let you know about that, and then also, you should have received our summer uh, summer information. We got all kinds of fun things that are going to happen this summer, and because uh, we don't want you to be bored, you know, like, you know, summer's not the same when you're working all the time, right? You know, you always look when you're in school, you got summer off. Uh, but we got some uh, fun things planned for this summer. We are not just going to wave the white flag, you know, and uh, uh, wait and crank up till fall. So uh, when you came in, you should have received some of that information, and you'll see that in our, our communication as well. And then also... Uh, last, uh, next Saturday, we have a team of 22 people that are leaving for Kenai, Alaska on our summer missions trip. Uh, we have a great opportunity. We're going to be doing mega sports camp in two locations, one in Kenai, uh, about three hours away from Anchorage, and then the other in Aurora Heights, about 30 minutes away. So we'll do mega sports camp in the morning. Take a quick break for lunch, get on the road, do mega sports camp uh, in the afternoon. So, we're really excited about these ministry opportunities. And uh, it's our second team that we'll send out uh, uh, this year. So, uh, we're going to do a prayer this morning. I know some of them are serving, some of them are out. But if you're in here and you're part of our summer missions team, would you just stand where you're at? Would you stand? There you go. We've got a good number here. Naomi, there you go. I was like, she just wants her name called, so, uh, and keep standing, because I'm going to pray for you guys, so, uh, would you as a church, would you pray for us as we send this team out this week, so Lord, it is our honor, Lord, to go serve in, uh, 
spread the gospel, Lord, to partner with other churches, Lord, to just feel like they need a refresh and a reboot in their, in their church. And, Lord, so we, we pray for safe travel. We pray for good health. Lord, we pray that the gospel would go forward. We pray for relationships that, we, that would be built. We pray for the leadership of those two churches and those and the two churches themselves. We pray, Lord, as they're doing outreach, Lord, that the seed and communication would, would fall on good soil, Lord, and that you would use this team for your glory and for your honor. And we pray the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we walk in your power and your anointing. So God, we ask you to be with us as we travel, as we minister, bring us home safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So no, I won't bring you home a souvenir before you ask me, okay? So uh, all right, Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to uh, end this series on the fruit of the Spirit this morning, and if you've missed the other the other weeks, they're on our iTunes podcast, they're on uh, uh, YouTube, they're on Facebook. You can catch uh, catch those. So we've been this series is called Good Fruit, and we are looking at the continued spiritual conflict with our flesh. And the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that makes us like Jesus that we know as the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm going to start reading uh, Galatians 5 and verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do whatever, you, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 24, all right? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. So since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now in the middle of that, and I pull this passage out because this has kind of been the you know, the template for the series is the fruit of the Spirit. So he gives a contrast of the works of the flesh and now the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I want to I want to read those. But the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So I want to remind you, of, as I have done every week, it is impossible to have an outward change of behavior without an inner working of the heart that comes from the Lord. You, on your own, with determination and self-will, cannot produce the fruit that I just read to you. It is a fruit that is born entirely of the Holy Spirit that comes from our closeness to Jesus. This is a fruit born by the Holy Spirit and is not a product of human will or effort. Now, Preaching and reading about it can make you more aware and conscious if you need, you know, or see some deficiency in your life in these areas. But as far as you going, man, I'm just going to be more determined to have the love of God. That would be impossible. That is only born as the Holy Spirit works that in our life. And I want to say 
Again, as a reminder, once you become a Christian, you've now entered a spiritual conflict that never ends. You are born with the, that flesh that I just read, those, those acts of the flesh. You were born with those in, with, in your heart. It is your first nature. It's your first inclination. And then when we become saved, the Holy Spirit, the grace of Jesus starts working in our heart. And we have this back and forth the rest of our lives. I don't care how long you have been a Christian. You have always got to be on guard because the flesh will try to rear itself in your life. All right? Now, you all know that because we battle it every day. Okay? We want to do, we want to do certain things. We want to live right. We want to live by the Spirit. But there's something down here that that, that just, you know, it's not easy. We always have to fight. And that's what that passage says, that there's always a conflict. Romans 8 says, Those who live according to the flesh, that old carnal life, have their minds set on the flesh and what, and what it desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So, there's, there's always this battle, and that's why your devotions and things like that are important to strengthen your spirit, man, because the flesh does not go away. It does not go away. So in the past series, we've talked, in the past, we've talked about the fruit of the spirit of love, joy, gentleness, patience, kindness, and self-control. And we're going to finish the, the group today. So the fruit of the, the, fruit of the spirit, faithfulness. The fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness. So how many of you have ever been to Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park? Would you raise your hand? Wow. Hey, thanks for the invitation. I appreciate that. So Lamar, Caddy just went, didn't invite any of us out there. Wow. So, so if you go to Yellowstone, which I haven't, okay, well, if you go to Yellowstone, they have, a, you know, a, a geologic wonder there called Oh, I mean, excuse me, it's a geyser, okay? It's water and steam that's beneath the earth, and it's all constricted, and it gets bottled up. And then after a period of time, it just, it just blows. It just, you know, just kind of uh, explodes. And, it, and, and each eruption lasts about, you know, a minute or so. And it, when it does erupt, it's between 4,000 and 8,000. Thousand gallons of water that you know that that come up and it's at uh, you know it goes over a hundred feet in the air. The water is about 170 degrees, or the steam you know when it uh, when it explodes. But the 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 thing that's interesting about this is that this this eruption happens about every 90 minutes. About every 90 minutes. Like you can just almost time your clock by that, you know, that, that this is going to, uh, it's going to erupt. Now, what is the name of this? Old Faithful. Old Faithful. Why did they name it Old Faithful? Because every 90 minutes, and now we don't know how many thousands of years this has happened, but we know that it was discovered in 1870. So since 1870, it has erupted about every 90 minutes since we've known about it. So it's, the, it's got the name Old Faithful. Old Faithful. Faithfulness, the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness, consistent when making a promise. A promise keeper. Faithful to a task. Dependable, dedicated, and worthy of trust, unchanging, and loyal. That's faithfulness. Faithfulness has a bad reputation sometimes. That faithfulness is just boring. It's just boring. It's so predictable. There's no spontaneity at all. Just, it's just faithful. You know, just being faithful. But I'm telling you, faithfulness is an important part of our spiritual life. 1 Corinthians 4 says, Now it is required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. So faithfulness is something that is 
proven. It is a title that is earned because of your consistent dependability over a period of time. It is consistency lived out. So it's now, requ- uh, now it is required. Those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. So you have opportunity to prove faithfulness in your life. And if you are, then you have passed that test. So faithfulness, you know, comes across and has several applications to our life that I want to mention this morning. Number one is like fa- being faithful to God. Being faithful to God. Some people are all over the place when it comes to their faithful, being faithful to God. They are up, down, in, out, hot, cold. They're all over the place. And just being faithful, just being consistent over a period of time is a great spiritual value. We see faithfulness lived out in a lot of places in the Bible, but one of my favorite examples is Obadiah. Obadiah out of the Old Testament. Obadiah served God faithfully while working under King Ahab. Horrible King Ahab. You know, uh, I mean, you talk about a hostile work environment. You had it with, with, with King Ahab. So Obadiah served God since he was young. He was a young man that developed a pattern of just being faithful when it, when it came to his walk with God. He was a devout believer who worked in the palace of Ahab, and he earned Ahab's trust. And finally, he was the palace administrator. Man, he was a high-ranking official in the house of evil King Ahab, but he was faithful to God. He was faithful to God. So while Ahab and Jezebel, while they were killing prophets, Obadiah was one that was finding these young prophets and he was putting them in caves and he was, he was keeping that prophetic line open. He was feeding them. The entire time he's working for, a- for Ahab, his circumstances that he lived in did not determine his faithfulness to God because his faithfulness to God was deeply embedded in his heart. All right? Now listen, not everyone can be an Elijah, okay? Go, go speak to the king, man, in the heavens. They, they, they don't reign, okay? Not everybody can be an Elijah. And I want to say, too, Elijah had his ups and downs. I mean, you're talking about someone that was hot and cold in their faith, had great moments of faith, and then had great moments of, of doubt. That would be Elijah. Obadiah wasn't that. Obadiah was faithful. Is Elijah... This great man of God, he's up and down. He's all over the place. He's given up. He's wanting to die. He's wanting to quit. But even under the same adversity, here is Obadiah who lives under the danger every day. And he's just faithful to God. He was consistent. God's greatest works are done through faithful servants in everyday places. God needs the faithful, consistent life of believers who are just faithful, okay? All hot and cold, all over the place. They're in church, out of church, in a ministry, out of ministry. You see them all the time. You don't see them all the time. All over the place. Faithfulness is the key. Faithfulness to God in several ways. Church attendance. Church attendance, okay? It's important. It's important. It's a value. It's important as much as you can be in the house of God. Now, it's kind of funny that this sermon comes on Memorial Day weekend, okay? I understand that. But, that, you know, like, like I, I'm not talking about those who are out today, but, but just being faithful in the house of God, okay? If it's Sunday, if it's Sunday and you're not working and you feel well, come to church. Be, be faithful. And I want to I tell you, because when we're, when we're looking for people to do ministry and those that, you know, people that come and go, hey, we'd wanna, we want to we wanna get involved with ministry. We wanna, we, we, we've got some plans. The first, one of the first things we look at is, are you faithful? <laughs> are you faithful? There are many people who are talented and have spiritual gifts, but they're not given the opportunity of ministry that's in their heart because they're not faithful. All over the place, in, out, hot and cold. What's important is how you live and act and attend when the ministry spotlight is not on you. 
People always rise to the occasion when there's great ministry opportunities, but it's in the moment that the spotlight dims. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? Christian character is important to be faithful. Not hot or cold, saved, unsaved, backslidden, on fire. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. We're not, we're not impressing people. We're on a spiritual high. It's every day. He says, your daily life, let your daily life, the way you live, faithful every day, let it win the respect of, the, of, of outsiders, people that see you every day. They see a spiritual consistency and faithfulness to God. And it plants a seed in their heart. Faithfulness is important. Faithful to God. <clears throat> faithful to our family, our spouse, our kids. All right? Being faithful. Being faithful. Being faithful to our spouse. Okay? Our spouses should never worry about our faithfulness. We should not have a relationship where our spouses doubt our fidelity, especially like if we travel out of town or we're late coming home from the store or there's, you know, some kind of unexplained absence. We should live faithful to our families that there's no, no doubt, no worry because faithfulness is important, okay? Kids, it's important to be faithful, Keep our promises. Show up. Be around physically a lot. And present emotionally when you're around physically. Okay? Like, it's, it's important. Faithfulness is important to the, you know, to the emotional development, the psychological development of children, having parents in their life on a regular, on a regular basis. And they're, they're faithful. My youngest daughter, Kendra, you know, uh, she decided, you know, I think it was her sophomore year, that she wanted to play tennis. She wanted to be on the tennis team at NFC, okay? She's never played tennis in her entire life. I've never seen her watch a tennis match. It's never been like a, a secret that we've talked about her whole life. Dad, one day, I just want to I wanna be Venus Williams. You know, it's never. It's just one day. She wants to play tennis. Okay, so we go buy her a tennis racket and, you know, everything that you need to, to play tennis. So, you know, she's on the team, but her matches when they were in town were on Thursday afternoon, okay? The worst time ever for me. You ask any of my team, Thursday afternoon, the door is locked. That's my sermon prep time, okay? I don't do appointments. I don't do... Anything but keep my doors shut and study. But Kendra's matches when they were in town were always on Thursday afternoon about 3 or 3.30. Okay, it was a terrible time. But you know what was more important was that me, me being there. You know, just, just showing up, just being faithful. Now, I might not have had the best attitude sometimes when I'm shutting down the computer, especially because, like, I would always try to encourage her, like, Kendra, tomorrow's your match. It'll be Wednesday night. Kendra, you are going to crush your opponent tomorrow. They're going to cry when you, when you get through with them. And she would always say something like, Dad, it's not whether you win or lose, but it's how you look when you're playing the match. And I love my tennis outfit. So when I'm shutting down my computer... And driving over to the tennis court, not, you know, knowing that victory is not that important, but it is the Instagram photo after the game, that's what's important. It kind of affected my mind. You know what? I couldn't be there when she went out of town, but I wanted her to know that I support her when she plays. And for three years, you know, on, on Thursdays when they were in town, you know, I tried to be there and, and just be, be present. And after the game, I'd want to talk, or the match, I'd want to talk about the match. She's moved on, you know, serves, volleys, uh, YouTube videos. No, 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 no. So I, I just want to say, not just in sporting events, but it's important as parents that we be faithful. 
that we that when we make promises that we keep them that our kids know that we are present in their life on a regular basis and listen to me when we are present with their life we are unplugged as well we are present physically and we are present emotionally when when we are with our kids because faithfulness to a child is very important in developing their psychology and their emotions and their and their self image faithful to your family faithful to god Faithful on the job. Oh, let's have revival this morning. All right. Faithful. We're on time. Because that's part of faithfulness. All right. Not arriving when you're supposed to be at your workstation. I didn't think I'd get an amen, but that was a good place. All right. Not arriving when you're supposed to be at your workstation. Now, I get it that it happens occasionally. Okay. All right, I get it when things happen in the morning. But if it happens regularly, it's an issue of time management and also of integrity as well. So being faithful, we are on time. We meet and exceed expectations. If the only thing you are consistent in is bad work, then you need to change that. All right? We meet and we exceed expectations because we're faithful. We're there on time. We're dependable. We're a good team member. We bring value to others. We work well with others. We are de- dependable. There's, there's a certain excellence that our work, you know, uh, that, exu- that, that our, 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 we, we do our work with. So faithful on the job. So faithfulness is important. Jesus said this, Matthew 23. Woe to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices But you've neglected more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. I read that faithfulness, it doesn't seem to me, fits. He said, you're you're paying your tithes, but you're ignoring these things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Justice, I get that. Legal justice, for a fair treatment for the poor in legal proceedings, mercy, Forgiveness by God, reconciling and forgiving others. I get that. Faithfulness, faithfulness. Couldn't he have added something better like prayer, service to others, remembering the poor? But yet he's going, just being faithful is important. You know, being faithful in in representing the gospel in the midst of all these other things. He said, you're paying your tithes, but you are ignoring just being faithful. Okay, It didn't fit to me, but I understand it. So, faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. Okay, So, if your life is filled with selflessness, out for me, inconsistent, fickle, disloyal, if people don't know you as a person that is dependable or faithful to God, family, or on the job, then the Lord needs to do some work in your heart, and He can. If you find yourself defaulting to these things, faithfulness is something that we cannot just determine on our own. It's a work that God does. It's a work that God does in our life. Next fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Goodness. Goodness. Sweet disposition. Gentleness in dealing with others. Affability. Consistency. Stability of character. Willingness to do good. Undeserved graciousness as kindness we talked about that last week relates to action goodness relates to character all right so most of you will remember like when you were a kid and you were going off for a little while to play at someone's house or maybe to spend the night what was the last thing your mother said to you when you walked out the door you better be good well You be good, or some of you got, you better be good, all right? Or, you know, like um, grandparents. Grandchildren love grandparents. Spending time with grandparents. Why is that? Why? Why? Because they're good to them. They are good. They know when they go to grandma and grandpa's, the rules of the world have been suspended, okay? Okay? You can now have cookies before dinner. You can now jump on the couch. Running around the house is now a good cardiovascular activity. Why? Now, parents, we view the grandparents with suspicion, right? We don't like this, this group. We don't, we don't like to send our kids over there. But they're good. 
They're good. Being a good person. Holy, I mean, Acts uh, 10 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and he went around doing good. He went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. He, was, he went about doing good. He was a good person. He did good things. He was good in his heart. And I love the, the transition there. All right. He went about doing good things and then all healing those who were under the power of the devil. All right. So like it seems goodness is out of place with this power gift, but it's not. You know, it's, it's, it's not, all right, Be, because, you know, goodness, we, we, if people are going to do great exploits, they need to, to be good. They need to have a decency, you know, in their, in their own heart. No huge swings and morality, temperament, or behavior. They're, they're good. There's a consistency of character there. Second Peter 1.5 says this, For this very reason, make every effort to add faith, to add to your faith, goodness. Again, goodness seems out of place. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness. Why? Why would we need to add to our faith, our salvation faith, our faith that moves mountains, our faith that heals, our faith that gets us out of the fiery furnace? Why? Why do we need to add to, to that goodness? Wouldn't there be something that would be better to add to faith than goodness? I mean, really? You know why? Because when you have faith and great faith, you need really good people and sweet people doing these works. When they're doing great exploits, they need to be kept connected to the character of God. They need to be like Jesus. We've got enough workers out there in the world who are arrogant and prideful and temperamental. We need people who are good people who are doing, who are doing great faith exploits. So he says, add to your faith goodness. Hebrews 13, 16 says this, don't forget to do good and to share with others because this pleases God. So I'm just saying to you, like, I didn't always think goodness was that important. I thought faith, prayer, miracles. But when you look at this, look, I want to read that again. Don't forget to be good and share with others for this pleases God. You want to please God? Be, be, a good, be a good person. And God can work this work in your life. If you're a little temperamental, you know, a little, uh, you know, bad mood in the morning. You got, you know, there's, you, you, you see huge swings in temperament. The Lord can, the Lord can help you there. Last fruit of the Spirit, peace, peace. The tranquility of the soul sense of well-being and assurance that comes from God, rest, inner harmony, absence of agitation or discord. Worry and anxiety. Man, they, they've really kind of come into fullness in the, last, in the last few years. And I really noticed it, you know, when we started walking through COVID, okay, like you heard the term fear and anxiety more and more. And I, I always wondered, was it always out there, you know, people dealing with it like they are dealing with it now, before COVID maybe, but it just wasn't recognized or acknowledged and, and maybe just COVID brought it to the forefront? Or is it, or is it worse now post-COVID? And I think probably the former. I think it's probably always been out there, fear and anxiety, but there wasn't always, you know, the, the natural, you know, uh, a comfort level to be, to, be, uh, to be sharing about this. So, like, you know, causes of anxiety and worry, great loss, that'd be a death or divorce, unsolved problems. And I put Hopeless. Sometimes we have problems and we don't see an answer to it. it it's just continual. It's hopeless and, and, and fear and anxiety and worry kind of take over. Conflict in relationships. Again, this is, isn't a bad weekend, but this is systemic issues in a relationship. And man, 
you know, uh, worry and uh, anxiety and fear step in. Uh, medical diagnosis. When you get a, a, a really tough medical diagnosis, sometimes we fall to anxiety and, and worry. Financial stress sometimes makes this worse. Bills, debts, bankruptcy, unemployment, uncertainty about your job. And then, you know, this, it, these, these things just kind of weigh in our heart. Anxiety is a, a feeling of worry and nervousness or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. So sometimes just not knowing how this is going to resolve or how long this issue is going to last and, and fear and anxiety and, and worry set in and it just stays on your mind all the time. All right. So how many of you don't even need a good reason to worry? You're just a good worrier, right? Hey, I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a worrier. It, it doesn't even have to be a good reason. I'm, I'm just there. All right, worry and anxiety sometimes are reaction just to issues that happen in our life. It's not unspiritual in nature. It just shows that you're concerned, but we kind of, you know, kind of default to worry and anxiety. But I want to say worry and anxiety, you know, is, it just doesn't, you know, work in the mind, you know, and the, the spirit and the emotions, but it affects you physically as well. So when I go... For my annual physical, my doctor always asks me this, okay? Are you under any unusual stress or, you know, uh, anxiety? And, you know, like, do I, do I look like I am? Like, I mean, what, what are you seeing here? And, you know, but it's a natural question for a doctor to ask because worry and anxiety affect us, affect us physically. They affect us physically as well. So are you a worrier? Do you naturally kind of default to worry? Do you find yourself when there's any kind of unresolved issue, man, you're in this pattern of just worry, okay? So let me ask you this. When you worry, do you pace? Do you walk around worrying? Are you a pacer? Are you up at night, you know, fretting? Is that, is that you? How do you handle it? Unemployed, bills, mortgage, college tuition, medical insurance, kids' braces, you know, jobs, all of that. Man, that's just part of life. And when some of those issues are unresolved, man, we default to worry, you know, and anxiety. But what is the fruit of worry? If I let that go in its fullness in my life, my circumstances remained unchanged, and I'm usually worse off emotionally. All right? What does worry change? What is worry? How is my situation different when I have a good episode of worry? What does it do? How, how do the circumstances of what I'm worried about change because I am worried? So I'm just going, worrying is a fruitless act. Okay? It doesn't do any good except it brings my mind, heart, and my physical body down. So there's no positive fruit to worry. It just kind of drags me down. It makes me discouraged. It's not good for my, it's not good for my blood pressure. And then also worry, you know, worry, it, 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 it keeps us, you know, when we develop kind of a negative perspective about life, you know, we can't see the things that God wants to do in the future because we've developed this negative kind of, kind of thinking. We default to worry and anxiety. And man, if there's something new on the horizon, maybe that God wants to do, we default back to this negativity, and we miss the opportunities that God presents in our life. Joshua and Caleb and 10 others went to spy out a land. Okay, Two said, let's go. Some, for whatever reason, said, let's stay, let's stay behind, okay? They were, they were affected by kind of a negative, negative perspective. So we need, if you, if, especially if you default to anxiety and worry, we need the fruit of peace. We need the spiritual fruit of peace. Not a peace that is resolved by the absence of, of conflict, but a peace that God puts in our heart that regardless of what we see or experience, we know God's in control. We know God's in control. 
Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, and you, you know this, you could probably repeat it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I, I've been saying Peace is not something, a peace that God gives is not something that can be generated on your own. That kind of peace comes from being close to Jesus and spending time with Jesus. And this passage just, it says that. It says in every situation, in prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. He said you're going to, you're spending time with the Lord, you're in your prayer closet. And then he says the fruit of that moment is going to be the peace of God which passes understanding is going to guard your hearts and your mind. So this fruit of peace is born out of a close relationship with Jesus. The peace of God is connected to this closeness and there is a strength that comes to you from being reminded about that. All right? John 14 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace, Jesus says. My peace. My peace. All right? I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Excuse me. I have mangled that sentence. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I'm not leaving you in general kind of, you know, uh, peace. I'm going to do something in your heart. This is my peace. All right? I do not give to you as the world gives. It's not a peace that comes from finance or relationships. This is an internal peace. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Brent, worship team, if you guys would come. So the peace of God, the peace of God, the fruit of the spirit of peace, or it, it, it keeps us from going back to worry and anxiety if we don't see any movement. Part of the reason I said people have anxiety and worries because they don't see any kind of quick resolution to their issue. But when the peace of God is working in my heart, man, I am calm and I am, you know, I'm doing well in the midst of things that may be chaotic in my life because the peace of God, the peace of God is in my heart. The peace of God, with the peace of God, we don't fret over the future because we know that God holds it in his hands. So when they're, what am I supposed to do? What's my next decision? The peace of God says you are doing, you are in good shape because the author and the finisher of your faith is writing your story. So don't worry about it. And you are settled with that peace even though there may be things that are unresolved. With the peace of God, we don't wring our hands in worry because we know he is charged the course. He is the captain of the ship. My life may be bobbing and weaving in a way that I do not understand, but the peace of God says regardless of what's happening in my life, I am good. Jesus slept in the bow of a ship during a great storm, and I promise you that ship was not the oasis of the seas. It was up and down and all over the place, but yet he slept because he knew he had peace in his heart. That God was in control. When your life is all over the place and you want to lean to anxiety and worry, peace says, no, God's got this. God's got this. All right. The peace of God. I don't have to worry about the storm because I know that he is the peace speaker. So when I've got all kinds of turmoil in my life, I don't have to pace at night. I don't have to worry. My health doesn't have to come apart because I know that God's in control and he can put something in my life, in my heart that just gives me peace in the midst of the storm. Paul said he called it the peace that passes, surpasses understanding. So when, when we know that we should worry and that the old person is worrying, the old person that you used to be would be worrying, but you know, where, where's this coming from? I'm good. I'm good. I don't know where my bills are going to be paid, but I'm good. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the resolution to this conflict that I'm in, but I'm good. We want to default because we feel like we should worry. But it's fruitless. But the peace of God, the peace of God stills me 
And it stays me. And then when things are going tough, I don't have all the answers, but that's what peace is. Peace that God gives me is not a, you know, the end result of having my problems, you know, answered. Peace is in the midst of the storm going, I am good. I trust God. There's a song of worship on my lips. There's a faithfulness to God that will come. And I'm at peace. I'm not going to weep, cry, shake. I don't need to binge watch something just to get my mind off. My heart is stayed. My heart is fixed because of the peace of God. Isaiah 26 says, here's the promise. You will keep me in perfect peace whose minds are fixed or stayed on you. Whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. He will keep you in perfect peace when your minds are steadfast on him. So I, what I'm saying to you if, if anxiety and worry are your defaults emotionally, there's a peace that God can give, but our minds need to be fixed on the Lord, okay? It's, and then there will be something unusual that will happen. This fruit of peace will begin to emerge, and you go, well, I'm a former pacer. I'm a former worrier, all right? I, I used to not be able to eat. I used to not be able to sleep, but now I'm calm. I'm good because I know that God is in control. That's peace. Peace is not the absence of my issue being resolved. Peace is in the midst of it, I'm still good. I'm still worshiping. I'm still faithful. I know that God is for me and not against me. I know that all things still work for the good of them that love God and they're called according to His purpose. In the midst of that, I got peace. I got peace. I got peace. Would you stand with me this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to just do a prayer really quick and then I w- we're going to prepare ourselves for, for communion. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I pray today. I pray today, Lord, in the area of faithfulness, in the area of goodness, in the area of peace. Lord, we want to grow. We want to make sure this is part of our life that's growing. And, Lord, we pray for the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, as we're close to Jesus, Lord, you're going to bear this fruit in our life And like the parable, the farmer slept, but everything grew. Lord, we're going to see that. And we pray, we pray in these areas. Lord, we pray that we would grow and we would be like Jesus. And Lord, I pray for those today who may may have all kinds of worry and anxiety and fear in their life. Lord, I pray today the peace of God. I pray that they will walk in your peace. I pray. They're they're just going to be confused emotionally when they should be filled with worry. But, Lord, they're going to be calm. And and I pray over that. I pray the, the peace of the Lord, that working of the Lord, would happen in their heart. Lord, maybe not the resolution of their issue, but, Lord, peace that will emerge. We just give you thanks. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Brent, lead us in a song of worship this morning. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I can Thank you. wash Thank you, Lord. away my sin. Thank you, Lord. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it. Oh, precious is the Lord that makes me white as snow.
Joseph will take, will lead you through these emblems in just a moment. So I want to do communion at the end of this, at the end of this series, because I want to tie communion together. I know it has other applications that we will talk about, but I want to tie communion together today with being like Jesus. Okay. So part of the the context of this is as we as believers, as we take communion, we are committing ourselves, you know, to being like Jesus, being followers of Jesus, living like Jesus, allowing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to work in our lives. So this communion comes on the back intentionally of this series of the fruit of the Spirit. And as we take communion this morning, we do it as a body today, but we are committing ourselves to living like Jesus. And I want to read these again because this is part of the communion the, the communion service this morning. But the fruit of the Spirit to the believer. This is needs to be part of our life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there's no restriction. You can live in love without restriction, gentleness, patience, okay? So let's pray together. So Lord, at the end of this series, Lord, we come before the Lord's table, but we're mindful today that we want to live like you. We want to be like you. We want to be like Jesus. Lord, we don't want to be a church that has outreaches and ministries and that we reach the world, but yet in our hearts, we are not like Christ. Lord, so we surrender ourselves today and we are mindful as we come to communion, Lord, of the importance of loving like you love and forgiving like you forgive and being gentle and being kind and, Lord, patient and the peace of that you displayed, Lord, we pray that working in our congregation. So, Lord, in this moment, Lord, we are mindful of communion, but also being like Jesus, living like Jesus, being a faithful witness of the gospel in everyday life. Lord, in areas that we are outside of the bounds of the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, we're asking for the powerful working of the Holy Spirit to bring us and make us more like Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 11 reminds us that when we are preparing to take communion, that this is a solemn moment, okay? This is a a moment of, of weightiness. And 1 Corinthians 11, 28 says, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink from the cup. For those that eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink a judgment on themselves. So he's going, hey, this is a big moment. Like you shouldn't just rush into this moment that everyone should do a little internal introspection. So we're going to pause before we go any further. And if this is a moment, man, there maybe there's ungodliness and sin in your life. Maybe you've been away from the Lord. This is the moment for the church to go, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I want to be clean. He says everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink the bread and the cup. So we're going to pause for just a moment. I'm not going to lead in a prayer. This is your moment before God to say whatever you need to say before the Lord to prepare yourself for this moment. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray your grace and your mercy across this place. Forgive, restore, hear the prayer of healing, hear the prayer of brokenness today. 
God, forgive sin. Wash clean. Lord, let your grace like a river flood over this place today. Work in men's hearts and lives today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You take your bread. I'm reminded of a time uh, several years back of attending another church on vacation, and it was in a liturgical setting, so there was very much a a process for communion. And uh, they introduced the idea that this is the body broken for you. And so I'm reminded in this moment of the body of Christ that is broken for us. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered it him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Isaiah reminds us that we look at the body that's broken for us and we question how he could do that for us. That it must have been a punishment from God, that the only way we can wrap our heads around it is that uh, that there was uh, something that was wrong But as I read the rest of this passage of Scripture in Isaiah 53, I'm reminded that his body was broken for us. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, the body was broken for us. The body was broken to bring us peace. The body was broken to promise healing. The, bo- the body was broken so that when we're lost, we would be found. I-, I mentioned attending this other church and participating in this liturgical practice of, of communion. And the reason I mention it is because at-, at every turn you lined up and you walked up to the front and Every person would partake and they would hand you the bread and they would say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And then the next person would walk up and they'd hand them the bread and this is the body of Christ that was broken for you. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. And so today my encouragement to you is that this is the body of Christ broken for you whose body might also be broken today. This is the body of Christ broken for you whose spirit might be crushed. This is the body of Christ broken for you whose mental health, whose fear and anxiety is tenuous. This is the body of Christ broken for you whose family is estranged. This is the body of Christ broken for you whose sin is still hidden. This is the body of Christ broken for you who is growing in love and joy in peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the body of Christ broken for you so that you might have wholeness, you might have fullness, and you might be fruitful like Jesus. Can we take a moment with the bread that represents the body of Christ And just give thanks that this is Jesus' body broken for us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your body. Lord, for your wounds, for the sacrifice. So God, I pray over this emblem today 
Lord, I pray that as we partake of this bread, Lord, we are reminded today of a body broken for us. Lord, and that we can come before you today and partake reminded of the wholeness and the fullness that we find in Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that your spirit draws us close to you and your body as we are dependent on you, Lord, makes us more like you. So, Lord, I pray just that special blessing today as we partake together. Would you, would you join us and partake of the bread this morning? As we get ready to take the juice this morning, which symbolizes the shed blood of Jesus, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and all that he accomplished on the cross. I just want to give you three thoughts this morning on the significance of the blood of Jesus and all that it has provided for us. The first is that we have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Since the beginning, when sin first entered the world, God had a plan of redemption through his son, Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross and he rose three days later, he paid the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be washed and made whole. It is through Jesus, through his shed blood, that we have redemption. The greatest impact the blood of Jesus accomplishes in our life is the washing away of our sin. I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus. The second is we have healing through the blood of Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice covers every area of humanity's existence. He bore spiritual torment for our sins, mental distress for our worry and fear, as well as physical pain for our sickness and disease. The stripes he bore and the blood he shed were for our healing we can receive healing through the blood of Jesus. And the third thing is we have authority over the devil through the blood of Jesus. I wanna remind you this morning that every day you have the right to exercise the authority by pleading what the blood of Jesus has done for you. I wanna remind you church that this morning that the devil is a defeated foe and that through the precious blood of Jesus, you are victorious, amen. Aren't you so thankful for the blood of Jesus? As we take the juice this morning, I want this to be a reminder to you that the power of the blood of Jesus has provided everything you need to live a victorious life of redemption, of healing and authority over the enemy. Let's pray and give thanks for the blood of Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you today to remember your sacrifice on the cross for us. We thank you for your precious blood that was poured out so we could be completely righteous and forgiven. We thank you for your blood that washes our sins away and redeems our life from the curse of sin. We thank you for the blood that brings healing to our bodies from every sickness and disease. We thank you for the blood that protects and gives us authority over the enemy. We thank you for the blood and we receive the full benefits of the cross and claim your victory over our lives. As we take of the juice today, we remember the significance of your shed blood and we give thanks for your love and your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake of the juice this morning. And all oh, precious is the flow Thank you, Lord. that made Would you stand? white as snow. Oh, other fount I know, nothing but the
give the Lord praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. 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 Well, hey, thanks for uh, coming to service. Uh, if you're off tomorrow, have a have a great holiday and uh, be with your family. I'm going to be down here at the front if I can pray with you, talk with you about your faith journey or anything. I'd be glad to do that. And uh, God bless you. And thanks for thanks for coming to church. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed today.